Okay, now we know that the graph of a polynomial, not this particular polynomial, but a graph of a polynomial in general, uh, will have a shape very similar to something like this. Now, for uh, a general polynomial, we're going to have the zeros that we can get from the linear factors of the polynomial. Again, if we factor, say, this polynomial, which doesn't correspond to this graph, uh, but if we were to factor this polynomial into linear factors and irreducible quadratic factors, then from the linear factors we'd be able to easily determine the zeros of the function, the points at which the function takes the value zero, and I've indicated those zeros by purple dots. Oh, well, you notice that some of the purple dots are attached to orange dots, and I'll explain that in a minute. But the polynomial, the graph of the polynomial, can go through the x-axis only at those points. Okay, and it doesn't necessarily go through the x-axis. The value of the polynomial can be zero only at those points. For example, we have a point here where the function takes the value zero, but comes up from the negative, turns around, and goes back negative, much like uh, the vertex of a, of a quadratic function or a parabola. We have another point over here where the function comes down and levels off just at the instant it goes through the zero point, and then turns around and dives down to a low value, uh, and then continues on as it will. The uh, point being that the zero at this point is associated with this sort of a behavior. We also understand that by looking at the highest power term in the polynomial, we can determine whether for values of x uh, to the left of the leftmost zero, the function is positive or negative, and also uh, whether the function is positive or negative to the right of the rightmost zero. For the odd power function here, uh, it would not end up like this. We wouldn't be negative here as well as here. We would be actually negative here and positive here for reasons that I hope you understand. I'm not going to go through them again. Uh, so look at the preceding uh, video clip and see if, uh, if you're not sure of what I just said. A look at the preceding video clip toward the end. Okay. The other thing that we get now, uh, everything I've said here comes from our knowledge of pre-calculus. It's not a calculus-based analysis up to this point, and now it becomes a calculus-based analysis. Okay, we have critical points. Those are points at which the derivative is zero. If the derivative is zero, the derivative represents the slope of the graph. That means the slope of the graph is zero, which means that the graph is horizontal. So at this point, the graph is horizontal, so that must be a critical point. At this point, the graph is horizontal as it goes through this zero. So that's a critical point, and that's the reason that I have both a purple dot here, because the function goes through zero, the graph goes through zero at this point, and an orange dot indicating <coughs> excuse me, that this is a critical point, that the function actually levels off at the instant it goes through the x-axis. And then here's a critical point. Again, the graph is horizontal at this point. Critical point here, not necessarily at the y-intercept. There's no reason the y-intercept should be a critical point, unless, of course, there is a reason. But it's very rare that you would have a critical point uh, at the y-axis. I wouldn't say very rare, but for a function of this degree, that would be highly improbable. Uh, a critical point here, critical point here. Okay, again, critical points where the graph levels off. Now, at this critical point, we understand that the derivative, which is positive coming in and negative going out of the critical point as we move from left to right, positive derivative, then negative derivative, meaning, of course, positive slope, then negative slope, means that the slope is decreasing. Positive slope decreases to zero and then goes negative. If a number is positive, 
goes to zero and then becomes negative, it's falling, just like the temperatures happen to be today. Okay, now sometime in the next uh, 48 or 72 hours, I believe, we're going to fall past zero degrees Celsius. Okay, it's been pretty warm. Uh, this is New Year's Eve, it turns out, and um, yeah, we had near 70 degrees for several days in the last week, including, I believe, Christmas Day. Excuse me. Well, in this case, the derivative is positive, then it's zero, then it's negative. The temperature is decreasing if we go from positive to negative and pass through zero, and the derivative is decreasing if it goes from positive to zero to negative. Okay, so there's a critical point. Um, we can test this critical point by asking how the derivative behaves. Does the derivative go from positive to zero to negative at this point? In the near vicinity of this point, is the derivative positive on this side and negative on this side? That's going to be the case here. That means that this critical point is going to be a relative maximum. Okay. Here's another critical point. At this point, the derivative is negative, then it's zero, then it's positive, meaning that the uh, temperature is rising if the derivative is the temperature, uh, <laughs> so that the derivative goes from negative to zero to positive, meaning that this is going to be a point where the graph hits a relative minimum. And then here, same behavior we have here, positive to zero to negative, we hit a relative maximum. Here, negative to zero to positive, we hit a relative minimum. Here, positive to zero to negative, we hit a relative maximum. Now, what happens here? Our derivative is negative, but it uh, eventually manages to get up to zero, but then it goes negative again. So here, the derivative is negative, zero, negative. What does that mean? Okay, it means that we have what's called an inflection point. Okay, the derivative is negative, comes up to zero. Now, to really understand what we mean by an inflection point, we have to talk about the second derivative. Okay, and I'm going to back up for a second and talk about what happens to the second derivative of these critical points. Then I'm going to return here and see what happens to the second derivative here. Okay, the second derivative is the derivative of the derivative. Now, at this point, you recall, the derivative was positive, then zero, then negative. So we have a quantity, the derivative, that's going from positive to zero to negative. That quantity is decreasing. The rate of change of that quantity, therefore, is negative. If something is decreasing, then it's changing. Uh, its rate of change is negative. So the derivative has a negative rate of change. Now, what's the rate of change of the derivative? It's the derivative of the derivative. The rate of change of a quantity is its derivative. I'm not being real specific with my terminology, derivative with respect to what and so forth, but we understand intuitively, and you've seen in other <coughs> classes and other videos that uh, we've discussed pretty thoroughly. Uh, derivative with respect to what? We're just reviewing here. So we understand that the derivative is decreasing, which means the derivative is changing at a negative rate. So the rate of change of the derivative is negative, meaning the second derivative is negative. The derivative of the derivative or the second derivative is negative. If we have a negative second derivative, then that means that we have this sort of downward concavity in the vicinity of a critical point. We go from positive uh, slope to zero slope to negative slope, positive derivative to zero derivative to negative derivative, our second derivative is negative. So concave down means negative, so, uh, the second derivative means that our critical point is a maximum. At this point, the second derivative is positive. The derivative is going from negative to zero to positive. If you go from negative to zero, to positive for any quantity, then that quantity is increasing. Its rate of change is therefore positive. So um, we have this positive second derivative making the graph concave up and showing us again that our critical point gives us uh, 
a minimum, as we determined previously. Now, what happens to the second derivative here? The second derivative, let's say derivative is zero, but is negative, but approaching zero. So it's coming up from below, meaning that it's increasing. So the increasing derivative means our second, deri uh, uh, our second derivative is positive. So the second derivative here is positive. And of course, here the graph is concave upward. Now we pass the zero, and what happens to the behavior of the derivative or the second derivative? Well, the derivative goes from zero to negative again. So now the derivative is decreasing. So the derivative on this side was increasing. The derivative on this side of this critical point is decreasing. So the second derivative, unlike at this point or this point, doesn't have the same sign on both sides of the zero. It goes from positive second derivative to negative. Concavity goes from upward to downward. That's called an inflection point. And when we have an inflection point at our critical point, we don't get a zero. Now, inflection points can occur other than at critical points. So an inflection point doesn't it mean that we have a zero, but an inflection point at a critical point uh, does mean, uh, well, let me back up on that statement. An inflection point can occur other than at a critical point. But an inflection point at a critical point means that we don't have a relative maximum or minimum. I said zero. Uh, we don't have a relative maximum or minimum. Now, I, I was just thinking the fact that we have a zero here. Um, what that tells us about a zero at a critical point at a zero, which is also a critical point, an inflection point tells us that we don't have a relative maximum or minimum at that point, and that therefore we have to go through the axis, and that the sign of the function will change at that point. Now, we could have an inflection point at a zero, which is not a critical point. Okay, An inflection point doesn't have to be at a critical point. And we would have a behavior maybe that looks something like this. We go from negative to positive concavity. Let's say at this point, the concavity changes from negative to positive. Okay. Now, this point could also be a zero, but this would not be a critical point. Okay. This is an inflection point. not a critical point, an inflection point, but not a critical point. And that could be at a zero. So we could have uh, the x-axis being here, an inflection point, which is not a critical point. And uh, we would just pass through. And in fact, at the point where we pass through, the graph would be uh, locally linear. If we confine our attention to points very close to this, the graph looks pretty much like a straight line. So at this particular zero, we have a critical point, meaning that the graph levels off. We have an inflection point, meaning that the concavity changes. Those two things together mean that we do go through the axis. OK, uh, we have uh, another zero, which is a critical point here. And at this point, it turns out that the concavity is always negative, so that that critical point is a relative maximum, so that the function behaves like this in this vicinity.